So in the previous class, we were talking about stable LTI system. And one of the formulas we derived is, well, the definition of stable LTI system is bounded input gives bounded output. So if we assume that my input is bounded from above by B, so absolute value of XT is less than or equal to B, then this is what my YT would be, uh, the expression for YT would look like this. And so I took the absolute value of YT, came, did some uh, set of inequalities, and I realized that if the impulse response of the LTI system is integrable, by integrable, I mean that the absolute value of H tau is uh, integrable. So this, this whole integral makes sense, it's bounded. Then the system is stable. And one of the exercise that I left open in the previous class was if the system is stable, then it turns out that the impulse response is bounded. And there is an exercise in the book which uh, tells you how to prove this result. So I'm not going to be proving this in the class. I want to give you an example, uh, you know, carrying forward the thought we had started in the previous class. I want to give you an example of an unstable system. Which is your unit your, your impulse response of the system is actually a unit step function. So it's an integrator. Okay, so this is integrated is an example of an unstable system Y. So let's say my input XT is equal to B for all T greater than equal to zero. So then I can take the integral xt, sorry, x tau h of t minus tau d tau minus infinity to infinity. I can write it as integral between zero to infinity of b u of t minus tau d tau what should i do next I know that my x tau is equal to zero for time tau less than zero. So I just change the limit of the integration zero to infinity. And I can replace my x tau by b because in this domain zero to infinity xt is constant. What should I do next? Any thoughts? Move. B is constant, correct? So move that outside of the integral? Yeah, I can move that outside the integral. What else? What do I know about u of t minus tau? So this is equal to zero when t minus tau is negative, which means, so u of t minus tau is equal to zero for all t minus tau less than zero. So, which means that for all tau greater than t, u of t minus tau is equal to zero. So what should I do? So now I learned, uh, let me write it in a different color. So I learned that if tau is greater than t, then u of t minus tau is equal to zero. Is there some other simplification I can do here? So I took B outside the integral because it's a constant. Now, well, let's look at it. So from zero to T, I know that U of T minus tau is equal to one. And from T 
equals t to infinity, u of t minus tau is equal to zero. Right, everybody understands this step. From zero to t, for, for tau varying between zero to t, u of t minus tau is equal to one. From time t to infinity, u t minus tau is equal to zero. And so what I get is dt, right? So even though the input is bounded, my input is bounded, my output will become unbounded as t goes to infinity. So integrator is an LTI system, which is unstable. So what does that tell you about using integrators in your, in your systems? What would you do if you want to use integrators in your system, knowing well that they are unstable system? What can you do? You differentiate them later? Uh, no, no, I mean, okay, let me give you an example of an integrator. A battery is an integrator. So you give, okay, let's, let me just write it. Okay, so I have a battery. This is an integrator. So you give an input a current and the battery is going to store it. Uh, what's the symbol for a battery? Okay, I don't know what the symbol for a battery is, but I'll just make it like this. This is my battery. And so I give it an input, my I of T and the battery is going to just store all that charge inside it. So it's an integrator. So what do you, so, so, so now that you know that battery is an integrator and you give it a bounded input, which is your constant charge, uh, constant current, like your phone, you have your phone, you have your car, you, you, you input constant current and then what happens? Do we get a bounded output, uh, unbounded output? Um, someone has written feedback. Okay. Yeah. Feedback. Yeah. Well, I, you know, this is not a controls class, so, so I can't really use feedback here. Uh, what do you think happens in a battery? Anyone heard of the term internal resistance? Right, so battery is an integrator, but once the battery gets fully charged, uh, the battery will no longer take any current because the internal resistance will be extremely high. Okay, so this is a battery is an integrator, but there is something called saturation that happens in a battery. And so even though integrators are supposed to be unstable system, uh, your battery will have some internal resistance which will go to very high value, in which case it will not take any new current, even if you give it a current. And of course, in the worst situations, the batteries are going to explode. You know, So if the internal resistance doesn't go to very high level, then it will go to infinity. And, and in that situation, the batteries are going to explode. And I'm guessing you must have heard about batteries exploding in multiple situations that happens when when these things when when things become unstable those chemical reactions within the battery become unstable so usually usually within batteries uh, uh, so in order to safeguard the batteries and not have situations where there are explosions 
typically is your cell phone batteries and uh, batteries in your electric vehicles or batteries in your hybrid vehicles and so on they have a lot of uh, associated feedback control mechanisms in order to prevent the batteries from exploding or things to become unstable okay that's just one one situation where um, you have an unstable system but due to some physical properties of the unstable system or because of the associated uh, control strategies for the unstable system it doesn't necessarily lead to explosion or or some really bad behavior any question so far okay uh in the discrete time case so in the discrete time case this is equivalently written as system lti system is stable if and only if your impulse response is summable absolutely summable Okay, and again, accumulator is an example of an unstable system because accumulator acts like an integrator in discrete time. Okay, so as we mentioned in the first class or maybe second class, I think, uh, when we talked about stability, we said, I mean, I have mentioned that uh, a, a stable system typically has internal way of dissipating energy. So you have your input is putting energy into the system, but because of some mechanism within the system, the energy is getting dissipated and that makes the system stable. Certainly, of course, the input uh, should not be so high that the energy dissipation cannot is not enough to, what am I saying? So I'm saying that, uh, so you give, you're giving it an input and the energy is getting dissipated and hopefully your input is not so high in magnitude that the energy is not getting dissipated at the same rate as the input is injecting energy into the system. So, so, in, those, so in some cases it can become unstable if the energy dissipation is low, but the input energy is extremely high. That is the situation that happens in nuclear reactors when uh, yeah, so you have to use graphite rod to control the uh, reaction, otherwise it will become unstable. Okay, so that uh, concludes the discussion on properties of LTI system. I'm now going to move on to a causal LTI system. And I mean, there are a diff, uh, very large <clears throat> numbers of uh, causal LTI system, but a broad class within this uh, whole umbrella are two types of system. They are linear constant, linear constant coefficient differential equation. and linear constant coefficient 
difference equation. So differential equation for continuous time and difference equation for discrete time. So examples, let me write some examples. So the examples of differential equations are RC, RLC, LC, RL circuits. They are constant coefficient differential equation assuming that the values of R and C and L do not change with voltage or current. Okay, examples of linear constant coefficient difference equation, your savings account. So your savings account gets an interest rate of 0.01%. Uh, that's, that's the interest rate on my savings account. And uh, I know it's a bad savings account. I should probably change it, but that's the interest rate on my savings account. Uh, and that's a linear constant coefficient difference equation. And then inventory. So typically inventory, like how many milk, gallons of milk Kroger has, or how many gallons of uh, juice Kroger has, that's the inventory. and that also follows, uh, well, if the demand is constant, then it's a linear constant coefficient difference equation. Of course, in, in reality, the, the demand is not constant. It's usually fluctuating. So it's not really a constant coefficient in reality, but on an average, it, it remains constant. So therefore you can, on a high level or at a planning level, you can assume it to be a linear constant coefficient difference equation. Okay, so what does linear differential equation looks like? It would look something like this. Summation of AK dy, DK yt over DTK k goes from zero to capital N. Summation. Okay, so this is a linear differential equation. This is what a linear constant coefficient differential equation looks like. The reason why this is constant coefficient is because AK and BK, they are not functions of time. Okay, I'm assuming that you have seen some of this stuff before in your calculus class and so on, how to solve such differential equations and all that. And we'll cover some of it in this class as well, how to solve such differential equations. In the case of difference equation,
the expressions also look pretty similar. It's summation a k y n minus k k equals zero to capital N is summation b k x n minus k. Okay, so how do we define a differential equation? Does anyone remember is so so when you when you want to solve a differential equation, what else do you need to specify besides the differential equation? Initial conditions. Yeah, initial conditions. Yeah, great. So typically, when you have a differential equation, you would give some initial conditions like sorry, not in discrete time. So y is zero. Uh, y dy over dt at t equals to zero, d2y over dt square at t equals to zero and so on. So assuming this is a causal system and we are giving it a input which starts at time t equals to zero, you want to specify what the initial conditions are and the initial condition comprises of capital N plus one variables. So the initial condition is Y zero, the first derivative of Y at zero, the second derivative of Y at zero and so on and so forth, all the way up to the nth derivative of Y at zero. Same thing with the difference equation, you want to specify Y zero, uh, maybe Y minus one, Y minus two, y minus capital N. So these are the N plus one initial conditions here. Okay, so once you know the differential equation and once you know the initial condition, you can actually solve the entire differential equation and figure out what the input output behavior of the system looks like. So we, any, any questions so far? Why are we doing um, uh, Y of zero and then going down to negative N on the linear difference equation? Why is it negative? So because Y of zero minus, so K goes from zero to capital N, right? Yes. So, so you need to specify what is Y of zero and what is y of minus one? So that is, so for n equals to zero, so let's substitute n equals to zero. I want to know what happens at n equals to zero. So then for k equals to zero, I need to know what y of zero is. For k equals to one, I need to know what of y of minus one is and so on and so forth. We need the specification all the way up to y of minus n. Capital, okay. this is capital N. This okay, is thank you. capital N, which you see here. Okay, now, so this is something that I'm sure you have all seen and we'll get into some examples in a, in a bit, but I want to pause here and tell you what are the systems you cannot model using linear differential equation or linear difference equation. So, so first of all, when are these coefficients not constant? Can someone tell me an example where these coefficients are not constant? 
I mean, yeah, maybe yeah. Any 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 example where you think that the coefficients are not constant? Okay, let me give you an example. So in vehicle engines, typically when you start the engine, uh, it is sometimes recommended, especially for older engines, that you need to keep the vehicle on for some time before you start driving it. And that's because they would like the engine to become warm uh, before you start driving the vehicle. So that's a situation where as once you turn on the vehicle, it takes some time for the engine to become warm. And in that situation, the coefficients which would depend on the temperature changes as you turn on the engine and keep it on for some time so as the vehicle's temperature is sorry the engine temperature is increasing some of these coefficients are changing in values and then the coefficients are optimal when the engine is warm and then you can start driving the vehicle optimally the other situation where this situation is much more sophisticated and complicated is in aircrafts and in rockets so aircrafts typically would lose you know hundreds of gallons of fuel per hour and so their mass is going to change significantly as they are taking off versus when they are coming down so in aircrafts uh, the mass actually changes quite a lot especially over long distance flights uh, so if you're taking an intercontinental flight to europe or to asia um, the flight, the mass of the flight is going to change significantly over the duration. So in that case, the coefficients are no longer constant over time because uh, the mass is, the, the aircraft is shedding mass in the form of burned fuel. And the same thing happens in rockets, but there in rockets, it actually, the mass changes in the matter of seconds and minutes. So within 10 minutes or so, a rocket is going to shed 50% of its mass, especially 50% of its mass especially if it is going to put satellites in orbit and so on. So that's also a situation where it's not constant coefficient because the mass is changing. On the other hand, if you look at heat transfer equation where you, know, you have a source of heat, let's say your AC vent and you have a large room and the AC vent is pumping hot air into the room and that hot air is supposed to percolate within the room and go to every corner and heat up the entire room. So that is a heat transfer problem, and that's not modeled by a differential equation. Uh, that is a partial differential equation, not a, not a linear or ordinary differential equation. So those are the cases that, that do not fall within this category of linear differential equation or constant coefficient linear differential equation. And you can have similar examples in discrete time for, uh, for linear difference equations as well. I mean, there are nonlinear differential equations also and nonlinear difference equations. Um, so population dynamics, so population as a function of how much food and how much, uh, uh, you know, uh, food and the environment uh, inputs are there, that, that changes the population of species. And that's a nonlinear differential equation and that's studied in evolutionary biology. People study those nonlinear differential equations. So a lot of different uh, situations that cannot be modeled by this differential equations or difference equation, but nonetheless, uh, a lot large number of systems can be studied within the framework of linear differential equations or difference equations. Okay, and that's what we are going to be concentrating on throughout this course. And we'll build a, a comprehensive theory of signals and systems on linear, uh, linear causal LTI systems which are modeled using either differential equation or difference equation. Okay. Now let's look at a simple example uh, of a linear differential equation.
Oh, this is a growing exponential. Okay, so this is the problem. This is the differential equation given to us for a system. And I give you an input x of t equals to k e raised to 3t, 3t uh, and then the step input. So this signal is only positive for time t greater than zero. And this is a causal LTI system. Okay, so because of causality, I know that yt is going to be zero for t less than zero. Okay, and now the question is, what is the response of the system with respect to this input? And we've talked about it uh, before, one way to compute the response is using the convolution equation. Uh, but today, I mean, but, but right now, let's try and think about how to compute the response without using the convolution equation. Does this, so, so how do you solve such a linear differential equation? Assuming we don't want to use the convolution. How do we solve it? Oh, I need to specify the initial condition. So initial condition is y zero equals to zero and y prime zero or dy over dt. So the first derivative of y is also zero at time t equals to zero. How do I solve this differential equation? Okay, I see a chat. No. Well, there is this theory. I'm sure you have heard about it. Oh, by guessing, okay. So one answer is by guessing the solution. Well, the guessing of solution will not work, but I see what you're saying. It's, it has a specific name. It's called homogeneous solution and particular solution. So the guesswork works in the particular solution part and the homogeneous solution is not using a guesswork, but using some um, some, yeah, so linear differential equations can be solved using this fashion. So let's look at uh, what is the homogeneous solution. So we typically say that y of t would comprise of y p of t plus y h of t. So y h of t is the homogeneous solution and y p of t is a particular solution. Homogeneous solution doesn't depend on the input. Particular solution depends on the input does not depend on input, depends on input. So the first step, let's try to compute the homogeneous solution. So I know that homogeneous solution is supposed to satisfy this equation. Okay. 
Okay. Any questions so far? What should we do next? Any thoughts? I think here is where the idea of uh, guess or onzons, right. where we assume y equals the e to the lambda t. Right, right, right. Yeah, great. OK, so let me assume that my yh of t is given by capital Y, no, e a e raised to st. And so I need to figure out, let's do so this is my hypothesis. Hypothesis. And we just need to find if there are values of A and S for which this equation holds. So let's just substitute it there. And we have A S E raised to S T plus two A S no E raised to S T equals to zero. this implies s equals to minus two. So it looks like if I pick s equals to minus two, then this expression will be satisfied for all t. And therefore, my homogeneous solution is equal to a e raised to minus two t. I think you explaining that has been insanely more helpful than the entire semester I took of differential equations. What what happened? Sorry, I didn't understand. I'm saying the way you explain that I think has been way more helpful than the entire semester of differential oh. equations. I oh, took. oh, I'm flattered. <laughs> well, okay. The Thanks. dude, the dude who explained it to us was crazy. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so this is the way to compute the uh, homogeneous solution. Now let's look at how to compute the particular solution. So we want to compute the YP of T. Uh, now I am going to use, now YP of T depends on the input. So, so I need to compute E raised to three T. So this holds for t greater than or maybe equal to zero, it's fine. Okay, so this is the particular, the particular solution has to satisfy this particular expression. And the question now is, what should I do to compute the particular solution? So let's apply the same trick. I'm going to assume my hypothesis is yp of t would be y e raised to 3t. Okay, so, I've, so my input is an exponential signal. So I'm going to assume that my output is also going to be an exponential signal. And this is of course for t greater than or equal to zero. Uh, this is a causal system. So for t less than zero, everything has to be equal to zero because there is no input. Okay, so this is my hypothesis. Now let's just figure out if I could find a value of y such that this equation is satisfied for all t greater than or equal to zero. So let's substitute that in here. So I have y three e raised to three t. Please correct me if I am wrong anywhere. Three t e raised to three t t greater than equal to zero. Let me remind you why is the unknown. This is what I need to find out. So what do I get? I get five by e raised to three t equals to k e raised to 3t
k over 5. Okay, good. So I was able to, so my hypothesis turned out to be correct. If I pick my y to be equal to k over 5, uh, it is going to satisfy the differential equation corresponding to the particular solution. I should probably mention this is for all t greater than zero. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so now we have uh, so, so my, so, so based on the homogeneous solution and particular solution, I have realized that my y of t will be equal to k over five e raised to three t plus a e raised to minus two t. This a is again something that I don't know about. I, I have to still find out. And this is for all t greater than or equal to zero. So if I, so remember I have the initial condition. So let's say Y of zero is equal to zero. Uh, I have to substitute it in here. Uh, what do I get? I get K over five plus A equal to zero, which means A A equals to minus K over five. Okay, so I have figured the following solution for the differential equation I had. Y of t is equal to k over five e raised to three t minus, no, uh, yeah, minus e raised to minus two t uh, ut. Ut means for t greater than or equal to zero, this is what the formula for yt looks like. Okay, here is a solution. We, we learned one solution in the previous class using convolution. We learned another way to solve the causal LTI system using, uh, if you have a differential equation, you can solve it using the uh, homogeneous solution and particular solution method. Okay, you can solve the higher order differential equations in the same method, same way, but the solution approaches are quite tedious even in those situations. So um, you have to solve uh, multi, uh, you have to solve for roots of polynomials and so on in order to get the solution. I mean, for, for up to two order, it's easy for, for systems with higher than second order uh, you have to you have to use computers. Okay, any questions so far? Should we write it in uh, in in general? Should we write it in this form, or should we introduce the x uh, x of t again? Uh, no, you don't have to introduce x of t. You have to write it in this form. This is what the time signal looks like. It all specifies right. the entire signal from time t equals to minus infinity all the way to plus infinity. Okay. Now here is the catch. Uh, I had told you that you can solve the LTI system using the impulse response. Uh, and now I'm telling you, well, you can solve this differential equation using particular solution and homogeneous solution. So the question is, are the two solutions going to be the same or are they going to be different? So let's, let's talk about it in, uh, let's talk about that. So 
solution using convolution. So now I have the following different. So I first have to find out what the impulse response of the system is. Okay, so what is the impulse response going to look like? So I have d y t over d t plus two y t equals to delta t. So I'm giving it an impulse input. What is delta t equal to? So it's infinity for t equals to zero, and it's zero for t not equal to zero. So how do I solve this differential equation? Sounds like a very complicated thing. Right, it doesn't look like an exponential signal, so you can't really apply all that fun stuff we just did. Actually, the easier way, uh, it's not the mathematically precise way, but the easier way is just to assume, remember that delta t is zero almost everywhere, right? So except for at time t equals to zero, it is zero everywhere. So I'm just going to solve this differential equation. And that would give me the solution to the impulse response of the system. So what's the solution to this differential equation? Anyone remembers what's the solution to this differential equation? Just e to the minus 2t. Yeah, e raised to minus 2t. So right it has to there has to be some multiplier a here okay now i'm trying to see whether i should take a equals to 1 Would it make sense to take a equals to one? There is some reason for because of which a should be equal to one here. Uh, let me find out what that reason is. I forgot what that reason was, but uh, for some reason, a is supposed to be equal to one here. Uh, and that's because the magnitude of the impulse response is equal to, so, sorry, the area under the curve of the impulse response, the impulse input is equal to one. So it has something to do with that. The, a has to be the area under the impulse response, but I'll check about it and I'll let you know on Monday. But assuming that A is equal to one, uh, my impulse response is actually equal to E raised to minus two T. So H of T is E raised to minus two T. That's the impulse response of the system. And I know my input X of T is K E raised to three T ut so now i can compute y of t which is the convolution x convolution h of t which is given by minus infinity to infinity x of tau h of t minus tau d tau I must specify this t is greater than or equal to zero. It's a causal system, so the impulse response has to be zero for t less than zero. Any questions so far? We have about five minutes.
Okay, let's try to compute this integral now. So I have minus infinity to infinity k e raised to three u tau, sorry, e raised to three tau u tau and h of t is e raised to minus two t minus tau u t minus tau d tau. Can someone help me solve this ugly looking integral? Okay. No one wants to help me. Well, I can take the K outside. Uh, I can take the e raised to minus 2t outside because e raised to minus 2t doesn't depend on tau. And then what I have in the integral is e raised to 3 tau plus 2 tau, so 5 tau, u of tau, u of t minus tau, d tau. There is no negative sign here. Come on guys, I'll buy you beer if you help me. No one uh, wants to me. I think the unit step functions uh, change the bounds of the integral. Yes. I just forgot how. Okay, <laughs> I won't buy you a beer. <laughs> uh, for the tau unit function, shouldn't it change the bounds from zero to infinity? Because anything less than zero, right? Yeah. Right, okay, so zero to infinity, e raised to five tau. I'll buy you half pitcher of beer for telling me half the solution. U of t minus tau d tau. Okay, what else? Can you uh, split it into two integrals because you have the u of t minus right. the u of tau? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll buy you another half. <laughs> hey, I was a different person. I want the other half. Okay. <laughs> yeah. t to infinity e raised to 5 tau multiplied by 0 d tau. Okay, so this term is basically zero. And so, thanks to your colleagues, I'm in a better position. I, I know how to integrate uh, e raised to five tau. It's supposed to be e raised to five tau over five and the limits are zero and t. Okay, I'm, maybe I'm going too fast. A any any questions so far? I'm just going to compute what the value is going to look like. No questions? So this um, is- I have a question. Yes. Why is the uh, t to infinity of e to the five tau time, where did that zero come from? In right. there? Where, where, why are we multiplying by zero? Uh, because u of t minus tau. So when tau is between t and infinity, u of t minus tau is zero. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so I have k over 5 e raised to minus 2t e raised to 5t minus e raised to 5 0. Well, I shouldn't write 5 0. It's 5 multiplied by 0. 5 multiplied by 0. 
and that gives me k over 5 e raised to 3t minus e raised to minus 2t. So I have the solution for t greater than equal to 0. This is the solution for t greater than equal to 0. So I did the impossible thing of computing the solution using the convolution function. And uh, you know, the time is up, but the only thing I wanted to mention is this y of t is actually the same y of t we found using the homogeneous solution and particular solution argument. So now you know two ways to solve a differential equation. One is using the convolution equation. The other one is using the homogeneous solution and particular solution approach. OK, so we'll see some examples for discrete time system in the next class. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, that will end. Oh, I have to talk about block diagram, and that will end chapter two. So that's what we are going to do uh, next week on, on Monday. So have a great weekend, and thanks a lot for your attention.